Sunday, November 1st. I heard Mama rustling around before dawn. When I woke up, I smelled the most heavenly aroma on earth. I rushed to the table and saw a small pecan cake. Mama had traded sweet potatoes and pecans for some sugar and flour. Both are rare and expensive in the colonies. Papa laughed when he saw the little cake. We divided it into five equal parts. Lem, Green, and Papa gobbled down their portions like starving pigs. But I divided mine into five perfect bites. Each one tasted better than the last, and we all heaved a long sigh and licked the crumbs off our fingers. Papa said, Thank you, Mrs. Lawrence. That was the tastiest cake I ever ate. We gave Papa the tobacco. He said thank you, and I swear there were tears in his eyes. Monday, November 2nd. I am so mad I could go dip snuff. Last night, a goodly wind came up, so me, Green, and Lem got up early and hurried down to the river to gather fresh pecans. We spent the day filling our sacks and had a fine crop of big, delicious nuts. It was cold and our fingers ached, but we didn't mind, knowing that pecans would fetch a good deal in trade. On the way back to the house, we passed three scrubby-looking volunteers. Each man had long, greasy hair and whiskers on his unwashed face. They saw our bags and asked us what we had. Green blurted out that it was pecans. The three scoundrels claimed they shivered at night and starved half the time and hadn't received any pay or stipend and the least they should get was a bag of pecans for fighting for Texas. I thought about poor Willa's suffering and was so moved with guilt that I gave them my bag. Next thing I knew, the two other men knocked my brothers to the ground and stole their bags of pecans. They shoved Lem's face in the mud. Lem was furious. Green was crying, and I was shaking. Lem ran off into the woods in humiliation, but Green told Mama as soon as we walked through the door. We did not tell Papa, as he would probably get all upset. I am sick about losing our pecans. I will never trust one of those volunteers from the States again. Thursday, November 3rd. Half the hen eggs were missing yesterday, so this morning I got up very early to gather them. Three eggs were still wet and warm from just being laid. I saw two volunteers creeping around the barn and ran inside and told Mama. She grabbed the old flintlock pistol and headed for the barn. She saw one of the men carrying a squawking hen by its feet. Let go of that hen or it'll be the last thing you see, Mama shouted. The men shrugged and cuddled the hen in his arms. We're hungry, ma'am. We volunteer to help you Texans, but nobody gives us food or clothes or ammunition. How are we supposed to help if we're skin and bones? Mama lowered the barrel and sighed. She told him to come back later and she would give them cooked chicken. The man tipped his hat and let the chicken go. Mama picked out a pullet and wrung its neck. We plucked the feathers and Mama cooked a big pot of chicken for the man and made soup for us. The man returned at noon with two others, and they ate every bit of chicken and cornbread as if it were their last meal on earth. Afterwards, they sat with Papa on the front porch and talked for two hours. They came from the same part of Georgia where Papa was born. As they left, Papa gave them his birthday chewing tobacco. Wednesday, November 4th. The morning was warm, but by midday the temperature dropped as a blue norther rolled in. One half of the sky was a blue-black color, and the other half was clear, as if the hand of God had painted a dividing line. Papa Lemon Green dug a big hole in the yard and lowered a hog barrel down into it, tied with tackle and ropes attached to poles. The work was slow on account of Papa having to stop and rest his leg often. Now all we need is a hog, Papa said. I checked the hopper beside the house where we keep ashes from the hearth. I will need them to make lye water for the soap. Mama chopped extra wood and hauled it into the house. I pulled down the last quilt from the loft and put the calendar calf into the barn. By nightfall, sleep pelted the roof. We ate our supper by the fire, wrapped in every piece of clothing we had. Afterwards, Papa took out a curved knife and began sharpening it on a whetstone. After it was razor sharp, he said, Lemuel, 
As soon as the storm lets up tomorrow, we'll kill that hog. Mrs. Lawrence will get her soap at last. Lem muttered, Yes, sir. He is miserable, and I don't blame him. Hog killing is sad work. Thursday, November 5th. This morning I heard all kinds of grunting and snorting as Lem herded some hogs and sows into a little temporary pen and closed the gate. My heart ached as I watched Lem scratching the biggest hog behind the ears and talking to it. Time to get the water boiling, Mama said as Papa limped out the door, holding the sharpened knife. I was very thankful that Mama kept me and Green busy bringing buckets of water and sticks of firewood to the big iron cauldron in front of the cabin. A hog's throat must be cut or stuck and the animal kept alive so it can bleed to death, or else the meat will be full of blood and spoil. The squealing is awful. Then they hoist the carcass up in the air and cut its belly open, and the innards spill into a big tub. Mama will pick out the fat mixed with the entrails, then give the rest to the dogs. The work is disgusting and makes me sick, but it has to be done. Poor Lem. I saw him wipe his sleeve across his nose and knew he was crying. The next chore was to lower the 200-pound hog into the scalding barrel sunk in the ground and filled with boiling water. The water loosened the hog's hair, and in a little while, Papa and Lem moved the carcass to boards laid out on the ground. Papa scraped all the hair off the skin, then began butchering the hog into smaller portions. Mama took the tenderloin for making sausage. As Papa carved out hams and shoulders and shanks, Lem packed them in a wooden barrel between layers of salt. While Mama cooked pieces of fat to render out the lard, Green fetched bundles of wood to keep the fire going. Mama poured the hog grease into crock jars to use for cooking and strained out the tiny brown bits of skin called cracklings to use for making soap. It took all day to kill and butcher the hog and temperatures didn't go above freezing. Our hands and feet were numb and we are still exhausted. We ate fried hog liver and onions with cornbread for supper. The men folk are asleep now. Mama is still up. She is grinding the tenderloin with spices and herbs to make sausage. I offered to help, but she said for me to get a good night's sleep, because tomorrow we will make soap. Friday, November 6th. Another cold, cold day, but I didn't mind because making soap is hot business. After breakfast, I fetched buckets of water and poured them over the ashes in the hopper at the side of the house to make lye water. Lem and Papa chopped more wood and got a fire going under the iron cauldron. Mama put in the lye water with the cracklings, and we began our vigil. Hour after hour, Mama and I took turns stirring the mixture with a big wooden battling stick. When the soap began to thicken and the cracklings gradually disappeared, I asked Mama if I might toss in some crushed berries to make the soap a purple color. But Mama said, Brown soap was good enough for my mother. It's good enough for us. When the mixture was thick, Mama doused the fire and let it cool. By the end of the day, when Mama broke it into pieces, we had our usual ugly brown soap. Mama is in high spirits. We have soap and pork, two things that make life bearable. If only Willis would come home, it would be a wonderful world. Saturday, November 7th. Papa hung the meat in the smokehouse, and Green fanned a low fire all day to cure the hams. Mama sent me to Mrs. Rose's house carrying a large chunk of lye soap and a big slab of pork wrapped in cloth. Mitty was thrilled to see me, as cold weather and chores have kept us apart for days. School lessons are rare now. Were it not for my precious diary, I think I would forget how to write. Later, Mitty and I were supposed to be multiplying our thirteens, but we were sneaking looks at fashion sketches in an old ladies' book magazine when we heard screams from down the street. We saw women and children running and strange men breaking down doors. My heart started pounding, and I said I'd better go home. But Mrs. Rose said, No, Lucinda, it's not safe out there. Those men are on the rampage. She took down an old musket that looked as if it had not been fired since 1776. Mrs. Rowe quickly tapped gunpowder from the horn into the barrel, then rammed in a piece of cotton wadding and dropped in the bullet and a little more wadding. Then she carefully poured a little more gunpowder into the flintlock chamber. Mama, Mitty cried. Are you going to shoot somebody? 
If I have to, no scrounger is going to harm my family. Take the butcher knife and hide the children under the bed. Kill anything that tries to get to you. We scrambled under the bed and shook like scared puppies. The sound of shouting men and breaking glass and splintering wood grew louder as the rampaging volunteers got closer. Men's voices and heavy footsteps reached the front porch. Then I heard the thump of an axe against the door. Mitty began shaking and whimpering, so I put my hand over her mouth. The door crashed, and Mrs. Rowe said in a voice as hard as flint, "'One step closer, sir, and I'll shoot.' I peeked out and saw a scraggly man dressed in buckskin stopped in his tracks. He backed onto the dog trot slowly. His friends laughed, and I saw that one of them was holding a bottle of corn liquor. "'We won our due,' he said. "'Take another step and you'll receive your just due in Hades,' Mrs. Rowe said in an unwavering voice. The men shrugged and started to walk away. Mrs. Rowe lowered the gun, and suddenly a third man came in the side window and grabbed her from behind. The musket went off, blowing a hole in the roof. Mrs. Rowe screamed, and before I knew it was happening, I jumped up and grabbed the skillet. I hit that awful man. He yelled and ran out but not before his head had a bleeding gash in it. Mitty and I bawled and hugged Mrs. Rowe. I ran all the way home and met Mama on the path. She was walking faster than I'd ever seen her move before. When she saw me, she shouted and hugged me so hard I couldn't breathe. A minute later, Papa limped up and hugged me too. We thought you'd been kilt for sure, Green chirped. Later, the whole Rowe family came over. Mrs. Rowe said the rampaging men were passing through on their way to San Antonio. They broke into every house in Gonzales, stealing food and possessions and molesting the women. The Rose are staying the night with us. It is crowded, but we feel more secure with so many of us. Mitty is still shaking. She says I am the bravest girl in Texas, and she vows she would be dead if I had not hit that man. Sunday, November 8th. The Rose stayed all day. Mama refused to let me go out alone. I helped Papa melt a piece of lead pipe and make more bullets. They were not very round, but he said I did a good job. We watched for the scoundrels all day, but they did not return. Monday, November 9th. Cold and rainy. We stayed in all day. Green is driving me insane. He makes faces and sticks things in his nose like an idiot. Hallie wished the weather would let up so he could go out. Tuesday, November 10th. After breakfast, Papa and Lem drove the Rose back to their house in the wagon. Mama and I were on needles and pins waiting for our men to get back. Mama wanted to wash clothes with the new lye soap, but Papa advised her to stay inside behind barricaded doors while he was gone. Papa and Lem were gone a very long time. When they returned, Papa was in a tolerable good mood. The convention in San Felipe has not declared Texas's independence after all. They signed a document declaring that Texas will remain loyal to Mexico, but the Texans will fight to restore the old Mexican Constitution of 1824, the one that Santa Ana abolished. Wednesday, November 11th. We received a letter from Willis in San Antonio. It says, Dearest mother, father, brothers, and little sister, there have been no more fights with the Mexicans. Everyone is hungry and cold. We are on the constant prowl for food. When we were left, we were still wearing only our thin summer clothes, thinking the war would be over in a week's time. But if the cold doesn't kill us, then surely the boredom will. The enemy seems content to stay inside town, and there is nothing to do all day except throw knives and have shooting contests. General Austin told us to save our ammunition, so even that is forbidden. Volunteers from New Orleans arrived and boasted of being the best shots in the States, so naturally some of our Texan boys had to prove them otherwise. Many local Mexicans, they call themselves Teanos, for they come from Texas, have joined our forces. They despise Santa Ana, too. I would be obliged if you could send me a warmer shirt and all the gunpowder and lead you can find. Some are tired of this waiting and say they will return home if they don't get to fight soon. I know as soon as General Austin decides to attack San Antonio, the victory will be ours. We are eager and ready to fight, 
if the enemy would but show his face. Do not worry about me. My love to all of you. Willis James Lawrence I cannot finish my diary entry. My heart is aching too much for dear Willis. I keep imagining him in his thin blue cotton shirt and only one quilt to cover him from the cold. Sunday, November 15th. Oh, my precious, precious diary. You were lost, but now you are found. For three days I searched in vain and cried my eyes out. And all because of Green and his mischievous ways. Being in a pure, ornery mood, he grabbed my diary while I sat on the front porch Wednesday evening after supper. He and Lemuel tossed it back and forth out of my reach. I screamed until I was blue in the face, but to no avail. Then Green threw my diary up on the roof. Papa made Lemuel climb up to fetch it, but when he got there, my diary had vanished. I climbed up myself, tearing the hem on my dress, and looked over every inch of the cedar shakes. I suspected Green and Lem were in cahoots, and called them every kind of thief and liar. On the second day, Papa got tired of our bickering, and laid in to Lem and Green with a hickory switch. Even then they did not confess, and swore they did not take my diary. This morning, Lemuel ran up and interrupted our Sunday Bible reading. He said he had a miracle to show me. All of us, even Papa, walked to the woods at the edge of the clearing and watched Lemuel climb up a tall tree and reach inside a big hollow. He pulled out my diary and dropped it down. Little pointed teeth marks covered the leather and some of the pages had been chewed on. But the bandit decided to have a reading lesson, Lem said. That old coon seemed to know his name, for he climbed down the tree and crawled over Lem's shoulders. He stuck his little thieving paws into Lem's pocket and fished out a piece of beef jerky. We all laughed so hard we shed tears. I told Green and Lem I was sorry for accusing them, but it was still their faults for causing all the trouble. Monday, November 16th. Green is still mad at me for the unjust thrashing he got. At bedtime, he announced that he was going to sleep with, Le with Lemuel from now on, as he was tired of being surrounded by cruel women. Mama said, Oh, my little man is growing up, and helped him move his pallet and pillow to the room across the dog trot. Since Willis is away, there is space, but it's much colder than the main room where Mama does all the cooking. I pretended good riddance, but it feels strangely empty now, without Green's excited whispers as he tells me his secrets and the sound of his little snoring squeaks. Wednesday, November 18th. Today is Mitty's 15th birthday. Mrs. Rowe is allowing her to spend the night with me. Mitty taught me the custom of the salty egg. All the excitement and giggling reminded me of the good times we used to have. Before bedtime, we boiled up two eggs, cut them in halves, scooped out the yolks, and filled the cavities with salt. We ate those salty eggs, giggling and gagging. No matter how thirsty we get tonight, we cannot drink. While we sleep, we will dream that a boy brings us a dipper of fresh water. And whoever that boy is will be our future husband. Mitty knows I want to dream of Galba, but she still refuses to tell me who she fancies. Oh, my throat longs for water. I do not think I can bear it another minute. Water, water, I need water. Thursday, November 19th. Upon waking, I drank a dipper full of water without pausing. So did Mitty. I am so happy. I did dream that Galba brought me a drink. I saw his face as clear as day. Mitty wouldn't tell me who she dreamed about until I tackled her to the floor and got her hands behind her back. Green tickled her ribs until she had tears in her eyes. Finally, she shouted out, It was Lem! Can you believe it? Plain as a post, Lemuel Lawrence. I told you I'll never marry a dirt farmer. I started laughing so hard my side hurt. Mitty got spitting mad. She grabbed her bonnet and left. Mama says I was rude to laugh so much since the Rose are going through a hard time. I will apologize to Mitty the next time I see her. Still, I cannot stop laughing when I think about her in a fancy dress and Lemon is dirty buckskin and Bandit is a groomsman at the wedding. Sunday, November 21st. Mama is sewing a winter shirt for Willis. She dragged the big trunk down from the storage loft and took out her one and only fancy dress, made of thick, warm blue velvet. Her callous hand looked out of place, stroking that smooth, soft velvet. 
she didn't say anything, but I know it pained her to cut it into pieces. I cut the scraps into useful shapes and neatly stacked them in the big basket where Mama keeps her quilt makings. Papa decided to take supplies in Willis's new shirt to San Antonio. I helped Mama bake extra cornbread and pack food. Papa and Lem hitched the mule to the wagon and left at daybreak this morning. They took the old pistol, all the gunpowder, and some handmade bullets. I used honey to make some sweet Johnny cakes for them. The velvet shirt turned out very nice. Green sent Willis his good blanket. That was so sweet of the little monkey. Papa told us not to worry, but as he hugged me goodbye, I felt strangely sad. Sunday, November 22nd. Rained all day. The hills are ablaze with red, yellow, orange, and brown, all mixed in with the green of the cedar trees. The beauty takes my breath away. Mama misses Papa so much. She didn't even want me to comb her hair. I did anyway. It feels uncommonly quiet with no men in the house. No boots on the doorstep. No pipe smoke in the room. No arguing and laughing. Mama let me and Green sleep in the big bed with her, one of us on each side, the cat all cozy on top of our feet. Monday, November 23rd. Too much rain and wind to wash clothes. Mama started a new quilt. She let me choose the color for the border around each square. I picked the blue velvet. We have some red and yellow calico scraps, a bit of green, and the rest is mostly brown, white, and dull gray. There is one nice piece of rosy pink. Mama said she will think of something special for that. She also cut some straps for a new bonnet for me, as my old one is filthy and ragged. Tuesday, November 24th. Bright and sunny, but cold. Mama said, with the men away, there wasn't much need to wash and iron. I walked to Mitty's, trying not to step in mud puddles. I saw Susanna Dickinson outside with her little girl. Baby Angelina looks prettier every time I see her, with her black curly hair now hanging to her shoulders. Susanna asked me and Mitty if we would watch her while she ground the corn in her steel mill. Angelina is terrified of the loud racket, so we took her to the general store and let her play with the pots and pans. Later, I asked Susanna if she had heard from her husband. She sighed loud enough to rattle the trees and said, He sent a message that he is fine and misses us. Her chin quivered as she spoke. If he misses us so much, why didn't he take us with him? If Almiron comes back alive, I swear I will never leave his side again. I'd rather die alongside him in the heat of battle than at the hands of those awful scoundrels who broke into our house. She wiped her tears, then picked up Angelina and went inside. I could hear her crying through the window. Poor Susanna doesn't seem like herself anymore. Nobody does. This war is fraying all of our nerves. I wished it never started. Wednesday, November 25th. Rainy. More piecing of quilt squares. Mama has finished ten squares and I have done four. A neighbor came over and helped Mama. They talked for hours and Mama didn't cook dinner. Green and I had warmed over red beans and cornbread. He grumbled, but I said Mama needs a day off from cooking. Thursday, November 26th. Thank goodness the rain stopped and Green has gone out to explore. Mama asked me to comb some cotton to make the batting for the quilt. We keep the extra cotton up in the attic. I dreaded it, and sure enough, a big black widow spider fell right on my face. I screamed so loud Mama dropped her quilt square and leaped to her feet. She was halfway to the fire poker before she realized it wasn't an Indian attack. She held her hand over her heaving bosom and laughed. The first laughing I've seen her do in days. I spent the day combing and cording cotton for the spinning wheel. Friday, November 27th. Cotton, cotton. I am so sick of cotton. My hands ache from combing the fibers back and forth until they are soft, then rolling them into long cords. Mama finished up the last square for the quilt and sewed them together. Since our quilting frame is broken, we will go to Mrs. Rowe's house tomorrow to use hers. Mama cooked a delicious stew to take. Saturday, November 28th. The Rowe house was full of life today. Mama, me, Mitty, Susanna, and three other women, and a dozen young'uns were there. 
After Mrs. Rowe pulled the quilt frame down from the ceiling, they stretched a sheet of plain white muslin over the frame, laid out the cotton batting, then covered it with the quilt top. The women cackled like happy hens as they sewed the top to the bottom, using tiny stitches shaped into lovely curves. Mama saved the piece of pink cloth for the center square and made it look like a rose with green petals. It is beautiful. Monday, November 30th. Hallelujah! Papa and Lem came back today. They had so much news that they sat on top of the wagon in the middle of town and answered questions for nearly a full hour. Lem had a knapsack full of letters scribbled from the men camped outside San Antonio, and he handed them out to the wives with great dignity and ceremony. There had been a little grass fight and another Texan victory. Stephen F. Austin had been appointed commissioner to the United States and left for the purpose of raising funds and more volunteers for the Texas Army. Colonel Barlson is now in charge of the Texans at San Antonio. Papa is exhausted. The long wagon trip aggravated his leg wound, and he is suffering something fierce. He grimaced when he lowered himself onto Mama's new quilt. He didn't even notice it, but I whispered in his ear, do you like Mama's new quilt? And he winked at me and said, Why, Mrs. Lawrence, I do believe this is the best quilt you've ever made. That blue velvet border looks right nice. Mama said, Oh, it's not my best at all, Mr. Lawrence. The pieces are plumb crooked. But I saw her smile when she thought we weren't looking. Mama cooked the best supper we've had in ages to celebrate Papa's return. But Papa fell asleep before it was ready. Mama said not to wake him.